Let me explain a little bit uh, about uh, the, the style of this conversation. We uh, don't plan on taking questions from the audience unless we have to. <laughs> uh, we may if, uh, if, if, if uh, my list is exhausted. Um, <coughs> and we're doing that to sort of uh, speed up the conversation. And actually, I'm going to ask another question. I'd like this to be sort of a speed round. I, I don't want to keep going right down the line every time, but I will. <coughs> So, but I am going to do that one more time, go down the line and ask for your top policy priorities this year. And I asked you in advance of the show, what, you know, what mandate ha ha have, your producer, have your producer members uh, put on you for 2011? And let's make this quick and just talk, you know, bullet points, uh, a few words about what your top priorities this year, top obstacles, and how you're going to overcome those obstacles. Mary? Absolutely. The number one word that we've been trying to use is just getting parity for algae. Um, to be included, to receive even a half a credit would be good for algae because we receive no um, fuel credits at this point in time. Um, so parity with cellulosic fuels, parity with any other fuels that are in the pipeline. So that's been critical. The other key is with this 212th Congress is education. Um, we continue to go back up to the hill. We just had 55 meetings on the hill three weeks ago um, with our annual fly-in, but we continue to do education about the importance of advanced biofuels and the whole portfolio approach of fuels, inclusive of algae, um, for our energy security and our national security. So that has been critical. And the other key is to continue the funding. Continuing the funding through the <coughs> DOE, through the USDA, and through the DOD. Um, we s significantly look at the DOD as being a leader. Um, Rear Admiral Cullum of the US Navy, who's a leader in renewable fuels, um, was at our event. And their leadership and understanding where advanced fuels can take the Navy and help us with national security and energy security um, have been key for us. So it's been education and parity. Thanks. Charlie? Sure. Well, if, uh, if a clean energy standard is the platform on which some, some kind of energy policy is going to uh, gain some momentum and attention by Congress this year, then what we would be looking for is the incorporation of thermal mm -hmm. into a comprehensive, <coughs> true clean energy standard as opposed to just a, the traditional thinking that focuses principally on electricity and, and efficiency programs. Uh, on, a, on a straight BTU KWH conversion basis. Uh, I'd say also, we, obviously, we have a challenge in educating a new crop of uh, members and their staff. Um, we still face real challenges in just making sure people understand the role that thermal plays in addressing energy challenges in our country. Uh, I, I would say, too, that uh, you know, parity is something that we've, we've been parroting for uh, the last several years because thermal's largely been overlooked with the exception of solar thermal and geothermal. But uh, in the biomass realm, it's been entirely overlooked. So that remains our challenge. Thank you. Bob? Uh, I think three primary goals, uh, the first being, and, and we realize this is a long shot, but at some point the country, kind of like healthcare, has to have an adult conversation about this, a federal clean energy standard. Yeah. Uh, second, uh, we want to save BCAP. Uh, BCAP may be for existing facilities really uh, the only game in town in terms of being a bridge to, to, uh, to some place. Uh, and uh, for uh, new developers of biomass plants, 1603 and getting a place in service date extended out is important. Okay. And Norma, biogas. What a yeah, I would echo the points that uh, Mary and Charlie made in terms of inclusion and parity, and then just add one more priority for our members, and that is policies which reinforce the stated hierarchy of waste management. So discontinuing policies that simply take all this organic matter, put it in a hole in the ground, and create environmental issues. Instead, we need to create policies both at, both at the federal level and the state levels to divert those <coughs> to higher and better and, frankly, multiple uses. Mm -hmm. And is that priority, uh, getting that done, take place on the state level more than the federal level? Yes. Um, I think at the federal level, we are concentrating on incentives that will ensure that the organic fraction of municipal solid waste, for instance, receives equal treatment in terms of definitions of biomass. At the state level, it is those uh, yard waste bans, um, the encouragement of diverting 
food waste. Mm -hmm. And then also, frankly, working with other industry associations, you know, the National Restaurant Association, the Grocery Manufacturers Association, all the generators of this organic waste that could be going into energy production as well as the other outcome from biogas plants, which is soil amendments or fertilizers. So it's not just a one fur, you know, you get a three fur. Interesting. Mr. Deneen. Good luck with working with GMA. Uh, <laughs> Mary said education and parity, I'll say education and certainty. Uh, with more than 100 new members of Congress uh, that uh, only know about biofuels generally and ethanol specifically from the pages of the Wall Street Journal, uh, certainly one of my charges this year is to make sure that they are getting uh, better information. Uh, they've got a, a better appreciation for the debates that have been going on in, in Congress over the past several years. Uh, and then we are responding to a lot of the nonsense about food versus fuel and, and those type of issues that we continue to face <coughs> on a daily basis that I've been facing for 23 years working for this association. It's nothing new, it just gets you know, regurgitated. So that's probably job number one. Job number two is certainty. It's not that we don't support parity, we do, but uh, we're looking at a situation where our tax incentive uh, expires the end of this year. Uh, when the tax incentive was, ex was extended just last December, uh, it was made pretty clear by friend and foe alike that uh, going into the future, there needs to be a fairly significant and meaningful reform of that tax incentive. And so that's what we've been working on. That's what we, tr we are trying to do as well, is to get to some uh, reform of the existing incentive that reflects the fact that the industry has indeed grown, that uh, there needs to be a uh, fiscally responsible approach to this that will allow the industry to continue to grow and more importantly, continue to evolve, uh, but do so that's uh, responsive to fiscal realities in Washington, D.C. right now that are paramount. Uh, right. So that's what we'll be doing. Joe, certainty has got to be on your mind too. Yeah, uh, the biodiesel industry is an example of what can happen when uh, uh, you have total policy failures um, in Washington, D.C. You know, in uh, 2010, our tax credit lapsed, as most people know, uh, and our, our industry was faced with uh, massive uncertainty and instability, and so we had significant contraction. Um, in addition to that, we had delayed implementation of the RFS-2. So in 2009, uh, we were supposed, the RFS-2 was supposed to be uh, in effect. It wasn't because of, of delayed implementation. Um, the tax credit was in effect, but the economics still were not there because of uh, a whole range of reasons. Uh, you know, we had a, a global meltdown in the economy and, and uh, oil going in a matter of months from $147 a barrel to uh, $33 a barrel. Um, the credit crisis, operating capital, the, the whole thing, we had import and trade issues uh, all hitting at once. And just about the time that we were coming out of that, uh, at the end of 2000. Nine, Congress allowed the tax credit to lapse. So then we had, in effect, neither the RFS2 or the tax credit. Uh, so we had further contraction. I'm glad to say that our industry, with the tax credit back in place, with the RFS2 now going forward with full steam, RINs trading at uh, approximately $2 per wet gallon equivalent, uh, our industry is, is going strong again. Plants are reopening, uh, jobs are coming back, uh, volumes are coming back strong. Uh, we are predicting, uh, projecting, again, uh, it's a danger of uh, projections, right, Dr. Newell? Um, but we are projecting that uh, we will uh, hit the 800 million uh, gallon uh, biomass-based diesel volume requirement this year, which would make uh, it the, the strongest, largest uh, production uh, in any single year for the U.S. biodiesel industry. So um, that's where we are, and in terms of our top priority, our top priority is successful implementation of the RFS-2, and a big part of that is uh, extension of our tax credit in order to help buffer uh, the uh, cost of compliance and, and get this program more mature and get it going uh, further. And so extension of the tax credits are, is our top priority currently. Uh, it's going to be very difficult given the focus on debt reduction in this Congress, but uh, we, we believe that we've got 
uh, a good chance. We've got, you know, a different set of circumstances in, in our industry. We're a quarter of a century, our, our tax credit is a quarter of a century younger than the ethanol tax credit. Uh, we just need to, we need a little more time to get a little more mature. Mike, we talked last night a little bit about uh, what Bob called the fiscal reality in Washington right now. And uh, tell us a little bit about that conversation in, in terms of, and carry on what Joe was saying about being realistic about expectations. And the, the number one objective of the advanced and cellulosic industries is to deploy new technology, to build a new plants, to put the steel in the ground. Um, there are two major frames that, that most of us in the biofuels world uh, agree on. Number one, that the RFS2 is the single most impo important public policy uh, in the United States today for first generation, second generation, and third generation fuels. So Bob and I will both say on Thursday to the committee, please don't touch it for the next two years. It took you almost three years to implement the RFS2, and it's the best policy we have, and it gives us certainty, and at this time, please, given all the circumstances politically, like our friends in the oil industry, who would like to roll the numbers back, please don't touch it. Give us two years of certainty under the RFS2. The second thing we would say, and depending on who you are and where you are in this, this, uh, this sector, um, tax policy is incredibly important to sending a signal to Wall Street and Silicon Valley and other places to help give you a certainty around what you're going to make on your product uh, price. Um, and our tax policy for the biofuels has been hit and miss, ad hoc, and it's not at parity in any of the provisions. One's for a buck, one's for 50 cents, one's for a feedstock, one's a blenders, one's a product credit, and unfortunately there's no one in this room that got covered by 1603, uh, which is the investment tax credit, which allows smaller companies to take advantage of an event, a capital event, which they might actually be able to fund the building of the plant. And the third thing I would say is, if we're, what we're really trying to do is deploy these technologies, if we could extend the procurement process, particularly with the Department of Defense, by extending the period of time in which the U.S. military could buy renewable fuels for jet, for instance, that would be an enormously helpful event for a collateral uh, event that could help us build some of these plants. So those would be the three things I would say. Um, all of this is difficult because let me tell you, and Bob will tell you, and other people will tell you, this is a very fiscally difficult Congress. And as Dr. Newell can tell you, in the 2011 budget, he just got cut, and so now he can't do some of the number projections, which we frankly need as a nation to make our policy determinations going forward. So I did a little lobbying for you in front of this crowd. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit more about a, the possibility of a clean energy standard. Uh, I need to be educated on this. Uh, uh, instead of, well, let's avoid for a moment the fiscal realities in Washington and assume <coughs> we, we do get a clean energy standard. Let's talk about what that does in a little more detail for, for some of your organizations. Um, Charlie, maybe you want to start that off again and kind of reintroduce us to the, what it does for your organization. We'll take it from there. <coughs> okay. Well, it doesn't do anything for, for us yet, but uh, I, I, you know, it's sort of a moving target. Uh, the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee put out a white paper asking for feedback on some general concepts of what, what they believe a clean energy standard constitutes. Um, and what is clean energy is very much a moving target in Washington these days as, as clean coal and natural gas and nuclear vie for attention under a standard like that. But in its simplest terms, it is, it is the structural equivalent of a renewable portfolio standard where you have a tradable commodity that creates value for people who are producing something that meets the definition. Uh, and then you have other entities that are under some sort of mandate to reduce their dependence on on non-clean energy, whatever that is, that, uh, that create a customer base for that commodity that has value. Uh, there's no reason in our view that, that thermal can't be um, connected in some way with, with the traditional application of that concept for electricity uh, because BTUs can be directly converted to kilowatt hours or megawatt hours. Mm -hmm. it, it is a little trickier to implement, but uh, I think Congress is up to the challenge.